Be prem pradipe aruti toma nayane jamuna nayane jamuna jore aniba nayane jamuna. Jamuna, Jodeoniba, Jamuna, Jodeoniba, Tomara Vida Hegi, Hari, Hari, Tomara Vida Hegi, Hari, Tomara Vida Hegi, Hari, Hari, Tomara Vida Hegi, Tomara Vida Hegi, Hari, Tomara Krishna Murari, 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 Krishna Murari.
Namaste Saraswate Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nevishesha Shunyavadi 
ಪಾಶ್ಚಾತ್ಯಶತಾರಿಣೆ ನಮ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗದಾಧರ್ ಶ್ರೀವಾಸಿ ಗೌರಭಕ್ತವೇಂದ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗದಾಧರ್ ಶ್ರೀವಾಸಿ ಗೌರಭಕ್ತವೇಂದ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೆ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೆ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೆ 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 ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೆ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೆ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೆ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೆ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೆ 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 ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಬಲು ಹರೆ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೆ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೆ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೆ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೆ 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 ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೆ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೆ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೆ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೆ 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 ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೆ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೆ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 
हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Bolo Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Jaya Jaya Prabhupad, 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 Jaya Prabhupad, Jaya Prabhupad, Jaya Jaya Prabhupad, 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 Jaya Prabhupad. Itai Gora Hariba Hariba Itai Gora
श्री श्री राधा गोकुलानंद की जय श्री श्री सीताराम लक्ष्म हनुमान की जय शिल प्रभुपाद की जय ग्रंथराज श्रीमद भागवतम की जय हिताय गौर प्रेमानंदी हरि हरि बो हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा एवरीवन वेलकम टू द सेकंड डे ऑफ आवर भागवत कथा प्रोग्राम दिस प्रोग्राम इज स्पॉन्सर्ड बाय द गोमात्सिया प्रोजेक्ट which is a project focused on preserving vedic literature and also the school of bhakti which is our uh, education division of bhakti vedanta mela so a warm welcome to you um in english there's a there's a saying when you experience an event where it really invokes a lot of emotion and it really touches your art you say it's a, it's a cracker <laughs> so i think yesterday we had a cracker of an event uh, those who came for yesterday's bhagavat katha and personally i can speak from personal experience i felt really touched by it and it was a remarkable uh, presentation on the bhagavatam on a very relevant topic you know in this kali yuga which is said to be the age of quarrel and hypocrisy we also although we do not desire or want to be we find ourselves in conflict with our family friends colleagues and even our very selves we find ourselves in conflict and the principle of forgiveness is a friend an important principle in our lives and the shrimad bhagavatam you know being the scripture par excellence you know conveys to us this principle of forgiveness in a way like no other literature and in radhika raman prabhu brought out those at least he just gave us the taster it was the first day um of 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 some of what we can assimilate from the bhagavatam uh, yesterday so i you know those who, who saw it and experienced it really are looking forward to the session for those um who are watching online uh please uh, convey to your friends uh, the school of bhakti live that this event is taking place we were expecting more people yet today but i'm sure we'll get as the time progresses just a few words about radhika raman prabhu um he he's flown in from america just for this event so from that perspective we're very grateful for him grateful to him and radhika raman prabhu um he's a very renowned scholar and devotee i i draw the distinction because it's a very rare combination you know being a very renowned scholar and a a, a devotee of note so we have in radhika raman prabhu uh, such a person uh, just something about him uh in his in his field um he holds numerous degrees uh the most notable being a phd in hinduism from the university of oxford which he had at a very young age of 21 one of the youngest scholars currently he holds the charles red chair of religious studies at utah state university and he's also the director of relig- of the religious studies program he's the author and editor of four books uh, uh the bhagavad purana being one of them and he has received four teaching awards and um he's a permanent research fellow at the university of oxford center of hindu studies he current his current research focuses on the bhagavad purana sanskrit commentaries he enjoys teaching world religions hindu sanskrit and religious studies theory and method i was i had the good fortune of of sitting next to radhika raman prabhu this morning while he was taking breakfast and he says you know there's many aspects of his life at the moment but there's one aspect of his life that gives him more joy than anything else and that is to speak on the shrimad bhagavatam in the association of devotees <laughs> so it's a reciprocal um prabhu was he took birth in a family of vaishnavas uh he was raised from very birth as a vaishnav and what was most remarkable about prabhu he he was homeschooled and he was homeschooled on the bhagavatam so he actually 
learned English directly from the Bhagavatam, which is quite remarkable. And, and when you, you listen to him and you see how articulate he is, then it makes you think how powerful this Bhagavatam must be. Someone who was homeschooled on the Bhagavatam is just so glorious when he speaks. So um, in our traditional way, we do our welcome by raising our hands in the air and chanting Hari Bol. So let's do it. Hari Bol. Hari Bol. Hari Bol. Hare Krishna. Over to you, Radhe Krama. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Um, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And many thanks to all of you for coming back for a second day. Um, today is the second of three parts on this seminar on um, the glories of Srimad Bhagavatam, lessons on forgiveness. And um, just a reminder for those who were here and a short synopsis for those who weren't. Uh, yesterday we, well, I, I started off by giving a, a general overview of uh, Bhagavata's greatness and uniqueness, particularly from a historical perspective. Uh, looking at a couple of aspects of the text's beauty and its philosophical depth, and uh, are, um, are trying to argue that the Bhagavatam is so much more than <clears throat> just um, moral stories or, or, or stories of values in a simplistic sense. Really, it provides a map for living life in this world with all its complexities and all the difficulties of reality. And we tried to demonstrate that with the story of Dhruva Maharaj, which is widely known um, and often simplified uh, to a great degree, but really showing how it's the way the Bhagavata provides that story. It's one of great depth, detail, and um, uh, complexity. And, and that's, that's a, a part of what makes it such a valuable story because we can each find our story in Srimad Bhagavatam. Um, we just have to look at any stage of life we're in and any particular challenge we're going through or any success we're going through, uh, we can find our story in Bhagavatam. <clears throat> and we can find people uh, who have come before us and are much more accomplished than us, who have shown us the way how to live our life, um, how to live whatever it is we're going through. So that was the first part of uh, yesterday's seminar. And then we moved from there uh, as an example of this uh, practical applicability and complexity of the Bhagavata, looking specifically at um, the uh, concept of forgiveness. And just providing an introduction to that concept by focusing first on Krishna's forgiveness. And we talked about how Krishna is forgiving in multiple ways. Um, we discussed how Krishna's, when, his, um, when the devotee's intention is praiseworthy, but the action does not match the intention, the action is less than praiseworthy, Krishna ignores the action and focuses on the devotee's intention. And when the devotee's intention is not very good, but the action happens to be good, then Krishna ignores the intention and focuses on the action. And when a devotee's intention and action are not very good, then Krishna um, simply waits for the devotee to seek forgiveness and then is very, very quick to forgive, even as he did for King Indra and the the, 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 um, the very uh, terrible thing he did to the residents of Vrindavan. So um, in this way, we discussed Krishna's extraordinary mercy. And we ended with one quotation from Srila Prabhupada's uh, purport to um, Canto 3, Chapter 2, Text 23. This is the famous verse where Uddhava um, praises, glorifies Krishna, uh, Krishna's compassion, his mercy in giving Putana uh, the status of his mother. Um, Prabhupada ends his purport to that verse by saying this, the Lord accepts the least qualification of the living entity and awards him the highest reward. That is the standard of his character. So we ended on that note. And uh, today what I want to do is talk about one direction in terms of forgiveness, which is how do we seek forgiveness 
How do we get ourselves to seek forgiveness and how do we actually do it um, when we have done something that is less than praiseworthy? And um, what is the, um, the, the process that the Bhagavatam gives for achieving, for, for, for doing that? Uh, and then tomorrow, as I promised, uh, we'll talk about the other direction. How do we forgive when someone has wronged us? So in the, um, in the different um, uh, scenarios that I described, where Krishna accepts the intention or accepts the action or forgives us if the intention and action are both improper, there is just one scenario in which Krishna finds himself incapable of forgiving. And that scenario is when we uh, commit a wrong against one of Krishna's devotees. Uh, when we do wrong to another living entity, particularly one of his devotees, then Krishna in that situation does not have the capacity to forgive us. Um, for one very simple reason, uh, the wrong was not committed against him, right? Just like if, um, if, uh, if someone offends you, right, does something wrong against you, and then I uh, turn around and tell that person, it's okay what you did to her, I forgive you. That doesn't make any sense. Right? Uh, how, how, what right do I have to forgive you for something you did to someone else? And so when Krishna, Krishna particularly Krishna's devotees, they're so dear to him and he's so personally affected by any wrongs committed to them that he really finds himself incapable of forgiveness. And the most that he will do is that he will, when we seek that forgiveness, when we have that remorse, he will direct us to that devotee and ask us to seek forgiveness from them. He will create opportunities for us to seek that forgiveness from the devotee. And we see this very clearly in the story of Durvasa Muni and Maharaj Ambarish. That Maharaj Ambarish goes, um, he's, he's uh, when, when he offends uh, sorry, when Durvasa Muni offends Maharaj Ambarish, right? Uh, Ambarish has been fasting for a full year uh, uh, without food or water. And just at the time when the fast is to be broken, just like for Ekadashi, there's a time to complete the fast. This is the time for Parana. And when that time arrives, it's sometimes very short. It's just one muhurta or two, 45 minutes, an hour and a half, like that. That time arrived, and just at that moment, um, uh, Durvasa Muni shows up with his 10,000 disciples and um, is hungry and needs to be fed. And proper etiquette says that when a guest comes to your home, the host should feed the guest first before eating themselves. Uh, Durvasa Muni, however, needs to go off and take his bath because that's what Brahmins do, is they take a bath before they eat. So he goes off with his disciples to take a bath and in the meantime, the clock is ticking and Maharaj Ambarish needs to complete his fast by taking something. And so with great caution, he um, consults the uh, ministers and friends and devotees that he ha around him and says, what should I do? And they say, well, why don't you take a little water? Because water is both breaking your fast and not breaking your fast. It's food, but it's not food. And in this way, you can respect the etiquette while at the same time taking something. And so he accepts the water and is peacefully waiting and Durvasa Muni shows up. And uh, we all know Durvasa is prone to anger. He's got a temper. And sometimes a lot of austerity produces a temper. Um, and a lot of knowledge also can produce anger also um, because both of these things, austerity and knowledge, can produce pride and pride very quickly leads to anger. Um, it, they, they, go, they go well together, pride and anger. Uh, and so Narada Muni, become, uh, sorry, Durvasa becomes very angry and curses Maharaj Ambarish by taking a, a tuft of hair from his head 
and throwing it on the ground. And, um, and uh, out comes this demon that attempts to kill Maharaj Ambarish. But Krishna never lets his devotee perish. And so his Sudarshan chakra was always present with Ambarish. And the moment the demon emerges, the chakra comes forward, kills that demon, and then turns its sights towards the one who started this all, which is Durvasa Muni. And so Durvasa goes running up this creation, this cosmos, to the demigods, Indra, and to Brahma, and to Shiva, and finally to Lord Vishnu himself, seeking shelter. He's made a mistake. And instead of going to the person to whom he made the mistake and seeking forgiveness from that person, he chooses to go to everyone else but that person. Isn't this what happens so often in our own lives? Right? We have some conflict with this person and we'll go talking about our conflict with that person to every other person on the planet. Talk, you know what happened and what did this and they did this to me and sure, you know, I acted like that but what else would you expect in that situation, don't you think? And we try to gain sympathy and we try to reassure ourselves that it's okay what we did. But the Lord Sudarshan Chakra never leaves us. Right? What is this chakra? This chakra, Sudarshan Chakra, is, is the wheel of time in this material world. Right? The Sudarshan Chakra manifests as the wheel of time. And time is the external manifestation of the super soul within our hearts. So the Lord as the super soul within our hearts, always for anyone who's pious, anyone who's got some goodness, the Lord is indicating, right? He's poking us from inside and not letting us rest, especially for devotees. When we do something that is not so good, when we offend someone else, Krishna doesn't let us rest. He pokes us from the inside. And we know we can't sleep peacefully. We know something is not there. The Lord's mercy is somehow stopped. Our conscience, many people call it, right? Our conscious, conscience doesn't let, let us rest. And in an attempt to assuage our sense of guilt and to soften the voice, to, to muffle the voice of the Lord within our hearts, telling us that something is wrong, we go around jabbering about it to everyone and say, this, this happened and that happened, did you hear this happen and so on. And Durvasa Muni is doing exactly the same. He's going to explain his situation from one end of this creation to another. And every single person says, don't come to me with that problem. Uh, the Sudarshan Chakra, stay away. If, it would, if after it burns you, it's going to burn me, and I can't help. And ultimately, they send him to Lord Vishnu, who's the controller of the chakra. And Lord Vishnu says, I can't help you either. What's chasing you is not, uh, is not caused by me. What's chasing you is your own offense towards Ambarish. So go back to him. And Durvasa Muni from way up there, he goes shh, all the way down and falls flat at the feet of um, Maharaj Ambarish and begs his forgiveness. So the best Krishna can do in a situation like that is not forgive but only direct us where we can find forgiveness. And this is exactly why the remainder of this seminar is necessary. Because if Krishna could forgive everything, if he was willing to forgive everything, then yesterday's would be sufficient, right? We seek Krishna's forgiveness and Krishna is all merciful. He takes the best in us and we're good to go. But that's not enough. We, 
as devotees, have to work it out amongst ourselves. And that's the challenge, right? That's the challenge that Krishna, that's the challenge that Bhagavatam places before us by providing us example after example of um, devotees uh, trying to uh, um, find that forgiveness, um, trying to seek that forgiveness amongst each other. And, um, and, and they, they provide a process for doing that. Um, let me start by saying that there's great relief in seeking forgiveness. The, the burden of guilt is one that is very, very heavy. And we feel its weight whether or not we choose to admit it or not. Again, someone who is good at heart is going to feel its weight. Some people are too numbed. Their lives are too overcome by sinful activity where they don't recognize what it is. It's just one amongst many. But in the heart of a devotee, one who is trying to be a devotee, the weight of guilt and anger and pride weighs very, very heavily. And so there's a sense of huge relief that overcomes us. Freedom, in fact, when we take the step of asking forgiveness, despite how difficult it is. And we'll talk about what makes it so difficult in, in just a moment. Um, so first of all, how do we know? How do we know when we've done something that requires asking for forgiveness? Um, and on one level, the answer is quite simple, which is that um, the community of devotees around us will tell us when something requires forgiveness. And especially for those of us who live in families, Family members can be very helpful um, for, for this purpose, right? Um, uh, your wife or your husband might tell you, you know, I, I think what you said that day came across in the wrong way. Uh, maybe you ought to go talk to that person again a second time and um, see how they're, how they're doing. Or you know, we've fought with this family for a long time. Maybe it's time to smooth things over, to give up our grudges. Usually, someone around us is ready to move on or can point out our mistake uh, much better than we can see it. It's very difficult to look at ourselves. Um, you need a mirror for that. And often, not often, always, the community around us is our mirror. Uh, and this is why that association is so crucial, because we see ourselves through the eyes of other devotees and often through our family. And we need to make sure, each of us, that we, have, we always have someone in our life who, uh, from whom we can take that kind of advice. And we know it comes from a genuine place. I remember um, one time many years ago in Radhadesh, I asked um, Sachinandan Maharaj about, I asked him, how, how does one remain humble? Give me one piece of advice on humility. And what he said uh, made a huge impact on me, something I've tried to hold close to me for a long time, which is that he said, every great person in the history of the world that has managed to maintain a sense of humility, that have kept themselves to size, is because they've always had a few people around them who can tell them anything they need to hear, and they can trust that it's coming from a good place. You see, a lot of the time, the advice we get, we don't know whether we can trust. If it's praise, we don't know. Is this person trying to flatter me? because in the next sentence they're gonna ask me a favor very quickly, or they want some advantage from me or whatever. And if it's criticism, we don't know. Is this criticism genuine? Or is it that they're envious and they're looking to pull me down and, and, and they want to supersede me in some way, 
And these things are there in this world. So it's very difficult to trust praise or criticism from anyone. And so it's all the more important that we have at least a handful of people, you don't need many, just a few, that one can trust to be honest with us. Uh, these are people who, um, if they give us praise, we know that it's a job well done, that we can, we can say, yeah, I did something nice for Krishna today. And if they give us some correction, then we know that we have to think it through carefully. So um, the community of devotees is very important, but especially our own circle of friends and well-wishers and family members to um, tell us where we may have gone wrong. But also then, the Lord is always there in the heart. Right? He's the super soul, always present and guiding every living being, but especially the devotee. He promises in Bhagavad Gita, Tesham evanu kampartham aham agnana jamtama nashayam yatma bhavasto jnana dipena bhaspata. He says, I'm there in the heart of the devotee and I'm guiding that devotee on how to behave and what to do and how to come to me. And so Krishna's guidance is also crucial. He will let us know, internally or externally. It's just a matter for us not to ignore that voice, not to muffle the sound, to pick up that call and say, yes, Krishna, I, I should do something about it. The, before we get into how to do it, the biggest obstacles for seeking forgiveness are threefold. Anger, pride, and fear. Anger because, like I said yesterday, usually it's not a one-sided affair. We saw this in the story of Jain Vijay at length yesterday. Right, that even among such perfect souls, it was a mixed, it was a debate as to whose fault it was entirely. Even amongst the Acharyas, that blame was apportioned in different parts and pieces to Jayan Vijay and to the four Kumaras and a little bit to Krishna for arranging everything in that way. So some things are the arrangement of the Lord and some things are our fault and some things are another's. So usually it's not just our fault. And so we harbor some anger because we've been wronged too in the situation. And um, uh, uh, pride because it takes a lot of humility to say that I made a mistake. I was wrong. Um, that's, that's a very, very difficult thing to do. And, and, and you see this actually even, even in children, even in a child, at a certain age, this becomes a difficult thing to do. As the ego and sense of individuality develops, that's a natural part of growing up. The ability to say, I was wrong, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, um, takes a lot. So we'll talk about anger, we'll, uh, that's tomorrow. We'll talk about pride, that's today. And then fear. Uh, fear of what? That if I go to this person and humble myself, then will I be crushed? Will I be humiliated? Will this person accept my apology? or were they kicked sand in my face? When I'm down, will I may be made to feel worse even more? That's a very real fear when we seek forgiveness, is what is that person's reaction going to be? Will they be generous towards me or not? And we'll talk about how to address that as well today. One last thing to say, which is sometimes we end up having to apologize for things we didn't do or didn't intend to do or didn't entirely do. It was just partially, we had a, 
a partial hand in that. Uh, maybe even the majority responsibility lay with someone else, and that person has never apologized, whereas the minority responsibility a little bit rests with us, and yet we are the ones apologizing. Sometimes um, we end up apologizing for a bigger mistake when in fact we made a smaller one. The apology is disproportionate to the actual thing we did. In all of those situations, it's okay. It's okay if we end up having to apologize for more than what we did, or if we end up having to apologize disproportionately to what we did, or if our intention was not that and yet we still apologize. That's okay. Um, sometimes um, the act of apologizing, of seeking forgiveness, is so powerful and so purifying that in the end, once we do it, it doesn't really matter uh, what exactly was the mathematical formula that, of, of blame that um, we were trying to work out. You know, um, I don't know how things work here in England, but in the United States, uh, when two people have a car accident, um, then the insurance companies for both parties will show up and they'll look at the police report and they will try to apportion blame. And it's a percentage. Y you had the right of way, so it's that person's fault but still you did not give your signal before taking that right of way. So it's still some of your fault. And it's 20% yours and 80% their fault. And then that's how they're going to split the uh, insurance money. And they're gonna pay 80% of the cost and you'll pay 20. That sort of calculation matters very little uh, when we seek forgiveness especially in a setting of devotees. Just the very act of letting go of whatever guilt that we carry is so relieving and so powerful and so extraordinarily uh, an air, of, a, 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 a breath of fresh air that um, it makes it worthwhile altogether. Uh, and, and finally, um, this process is one that we should not delay. The longer we wait, the more it festers. The more it festers in our own hearts and in the heart of the person from whom we're seeking forgiveness. And the likelier it becomes that the result will not be pleasing, even when the apology is made. Uh, one of the things we find in the Jayan Vijay story is that the moment Jayan Vijay recognize that they have made a mistake in blocking the entry of the four Kumaras, the moment they realize who they are dealing with, they fall to the ground and seek forgiveness. And Srila Prabhupada writes that their immediate turnaround is evidence that this mistake was accidental. Because when someone makes an accidental mistake, just like if you know, you're walking and you accidentally step on someone's toe, what's your reaction? Oh, oh I'm so sorry. I, 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 didn't, I didn't realize that. I, apologies, are you okay? Right? Because it was genuinely an accident. And accidental mistakes, Krishna forgives very quickly. This we read uh, yesterday, Apichet Sudurachado. Prabhupada defines that terrible thing that a devotee does as an accidental fall down, not as an intentional one, not an intentional rejection of Krishna, but an accidental one. And so um, being quick to take care of the situation helps significantly because it never gets easier. It just gets more difficult over time. You give it a month, it's more difficult. Six months, even more difficult. A year, 
And now it started to become ingrained as part of the relationship. Two years, five years, ten years, and sometimes there's no hope for recovery. So the sooner we find an opportunity, it doesn't mean that it will be successful immediately. Sometimes, we'll talk about this later, but for sometimes for a person to accept an apology takes them time. That's okay. That's their prerogative um, for, for them to, to decide when to forgive. It may take time. But to seek forgiveness is our duty if we have done some wrong. And it's important that we act sooner um, rather than later. Okay, so with that preamble, right, doing it sooner rather than later, making sure we have people in our lives who can help us recognize when we've made a mistake, um, relying on the super soul as well, on the Lord in the heart to guide us uh, for when um, an apology needs to be made, to not be afraid of sometimes apologizing when we don't feel we need to or not to this extent. With those, those uh, preambles, um, let's turn now to the actual steps that we need to take uh, in order to seek forgiveness. And these steps we find repeated over and over again in various leelas throughout Srimad Bhagavatam. The stories we've already mentioned of Jai and Vijay, of Durvasa and Ambarish, but of others that we haven't discussed as much, of Maharaj Parikshit and the sage in the forest, Shamikrishi, and um, his son, Shringi. Um, the story of Daksha and Shiva. The story of Indra and Diti. Um, of, of Indra and Lord Krishna. Of Brahma and Lord Krishna. There are many such accounts of seeking forgiveness. Um, we'll, we'll discuss selected ones of these as we proceed. But each one of them demonstrates a consistent pattern that the person seeking per forgiveness goes through in order to, um, to uh, apologize. Um, and that, that pattern has um, four steps to it. The first is to genuinely appreciate the person that we have wronged. To offer some genuine appreciation to them. Um, and this, of course, requires a significant humility. Now, uh, when we speak of humility, people often respond that, yes, we understand that humility is a very important Vaishnav principle. But you do recognize, right, that it's not terribly practical in our world. If you're too humble, people just walk all over you. They treat you like a doormat. They mistreat you. And then how are you going to ever succeed? How do you get anything done? Especially in the workplace, uh, where if you're too humble, your colleagues will just compete with you and you, get, you, you lose out in a very competitive, cutthroat environment that is today's world. So humility is nice, you know, after Bhagavatam class in the temple or, you know, after Tulsi Puja, we pay obeisances to each other in a temple where everyone has, you know, formulaic forms of humility that we have to practice. But you can't seriously do this in the world outside, can you? And I think the reason we feel like that, we have that genuine concern, is that we often confuse humility for something else, like weakness or low self-esteem or lack of courage. And we think that's humility because the two can be very uh, easily confused with each other. Sometimes we see people with lack of self-esteem or lack of courage or weakness, and we think, wow, what a humble person. But, but the two are actually poles apart. They're very different. Humility has to be grounded on a foundation of honesty, of first 
recognizing who we are, what our capacity is to serve Krishna. And as soon as we recognize who we are and we recognize who Krishna is, the natural result of that is we recognize we are so tiny in every way, in our power, in our strength, in our abilities, in our talents, whatever. And Krishna is so unlimitedly great. We are so small in qualification and others are so much more qualified. That's a natural result, but it begins from a place of honesty. For example, when we're asked to do some seva, some service for Krishna, uh, by someone who knows who we are, and we say, no, 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 I'm, I, I, I'm not qualified to do this, right? I'm, I'm, I'm just a fallen soul. Then that's not humility. That's dishonesty because we're not recognizing that yes, Krishna has given me this ability and the way to be humble is to use that ability in Krishna's service rather than keeping it for myself. I've given this example before in other talks, but the, the, um, it was the first or second time when my mother asked me to give class in the Boise temple, our home temple, small family temple. It was a Sunday feast class. And I don't know, I was 12 or 13. And she saw some capacity, some ability in me, and she said, you have to give class. And I said, no, I, who am I to give class? And all these adults sitting there, and I'm just a kid, and who's going to want to listen to me? And I can't do this, and what are people going to think? And isn't there this person way more qualified than our? And she just looked at me, and she said, Ravi, my, I wasn't initiated at the time, she said, Ravi, you, you really think this is all about you, don't you? This is all about you. When you sit on that Vyasasana, everyone's going to be looking at you and thinking what you're saying and how you're behaving and what you're doing and whether... She said, this is your pride. And I thought, wait, I was trying to be humble here. And she said, no, this is your pride. Why? Because... You're thinking about yourself when in fact you've been asked to do a seva that you have the capacity to do, but you're unwilling to offer that in Krishna's service. And that's pride. So even out there in the big bad world, even out there, when a person, not just a devotee, but any person meets someone who is genuinely humble, who has an honest, measured understanding of themselves and an honest, genuine appreciation for the capacity of others, people respect that person, they uplift them, they elevate them, they get out of the way when they want to do something. That's in, in, even in leadership positions, everyone wants a leader who has a right-sized understanding of who they are. Not someone who's too weak to call a meeting to order, nor do they want someone who's too full of themselves to not let anyone else speak. They want someone who's genuinely humble who has the ability to look at everyone whom they're leading and be able to say, wow, you have that capacity. This is why Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he says, Trinadapi suni chena tarorapi sahishnuna amanina manadena kirtaniya sadahari. And applying this verse is, of course, a lifetime's task. But the one place that I like to start myself is with manadena, with the idea of giving honor to others. Amanina, not expecting any respect ourselves, is tough. It takes time to get there. But manadena is actually quite a joy. We just have to practice. When we see some good quality in another, then expressing that to that person is once you get the hang of it, it's addictive. It's actually so joyful 
to appreciate others, to tell them what we see in them as their good qualities. We, we all have this weakness of being quick to point out another's flaws. And when we think of something good in another, we keep it to ourselves. We think about it, we talk about it on the drive home, and we never say it to that person. What a lost, lost opportunity. Manadena. And the amazing thing is, when we give honor to others, we receive it back. Especially in a community of devotees, or in a community of anyone who's decent and good-hearted. The natural tendency of a pious person is to respond when you receive honor with that same thing in return. And so mana comes very naturally to someone who's willing to give it. Right? And so amanina becomes easier as well. In, um, in Sharanagati, uh, this beautiful book of songs by Bhaktivinoda Thakur, where he talks about the different limbs of bhakti, one of which is humility, dainya. He says that humility begins for a devotee by remembering your past mistakes. By remembering your past mistakes and how Krishna has helped us through them. This is something worth thinking about for a minute. The purpose of remembering our past mistakes is not to drive ourselves into a hole and never climb out of it. When a devotee remembers his or her past stumbles, there's something very important that comes with that memory, which is the way in which Krishna helped pick us up after we stumbled. You know, we make mistakes, and then from those mistakes, we seek forgiveness, hopefully, and then we learn from that, and we improve. And then we go on and, and we advance in our practice of Krishna consciousness, and then we stumble again, this time in a higher way, in a more elaborate way, because we've gotten more advanced. So our stumbles are more elaborate too. And again, we seek forgiveness from the Lord or from other devotees, and Krishna picks us up and helps us recover, and we continue. And in this way, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years may pass in our Krishna consciousness. And we develop a library of such incidents in our minds. We file them away and we develop a library. And that's our personal library that contains not just our flaws, but also our successes in recovering from those flaws. In each one of those incidents in our library, we have a story to tell. It's not quite the Bhagavatam, but it's our own story of Krishna's actions in our life. And we can use that to great effect. When we find ourselves in another situation, the more books we have in our library, the more we can pull out and go, ah, this incident is vaguely familiar. I think I faced this before. And last time, I made a big mistake. And Krishna really had to do move heaven and earth to help me out, I don't want to put him through that again. I'll be more careful. Not only does it help us remember that we're just human, that no matter what our position is and how great we've become and how senior we've become and how famous we've become and how accomplished we are, not only does it help us remember that we're just that same small, tiny living entity, prone to fall down. But it also helps us remember just how compassionate Krishna is and how in every one of those instances he's offered us shelter and protection and guidance. Sometimes not in the way we expected, but still significantly. 
And those are the pillars of our faith in the Lord. They become pillars, the foundations of our faith to think, wow, Krishna did this for me. He did this Leela just for me. Maybe we're not um, as devoted as Prahlad, where the Lord appears as a half man, half lion just for us. But he shows up in our life in very significant ways that are just as important for us. Ways in which he picks us up and guides us and corrects us. And in the moment, those times are very difficult and they're challenging and they're painful. But in hindsight, they become beautiful. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, they become the foundations <clears throat> of our humility. When we think back and we think, I did this and Krishna did this and how wonderful is the Lord. And now I've learned something from it and I'm going to be careful the next time around. So humility is a very powerful thing. It's a very powerful thing, but dare I say it's a very practical thing. If we do, if we're humble, not weak, not fearful, not spineless, if we're humble, actually we practice humility. It's very, very practical. Humility is the most practical thing in this world. And it's the most effective thing, the most powerful thing. The best way to rise in this world materially or spiritually, is to practice genuine humility. And the foundation of that, the starting point, is to offer genuine appreciation to others. That appreciation, when we offer it to someone we've wronged, can go a long way to making sure that our apology is received in um, a good spirit, in a generous spirit. We have to till the soil to make sure that when we offer that, that uh, apology, it will land in the right place. And um, for that appreciation to be effective, it should um, be specific, as specific as possible. So instead of saying, oh, the prasadam was excellent, um, someone has cooked nicely for us at home, or at the temple or elsewhere. And instead of a quick prasadam was great, thank you. Maybe it takes the same amount of time, but just say something more specific about what is it about the prasad that you so liked. Um, the spicing was just perfect today. That sabji was excellent. I've never actually tasted this kind of sabji before. Or every puri was round and fluffed. Uh, whatever it is, right? Find something that's specific. It takes exactly the same amount of time, but that appreciation is going to hit the spot much more clearly and deeply and effectively than some sort of generic appreciation that comes off the shelf. So, um, we find this all the time. When devotees in Bhagavatam make an apology, when they seek forgiveness, the first thing they do is they start by praising that devotee in very specific terms, those prayers. If you look at the prayers that Daksha offers Lord Shiva after he's insulted Mahadev and uh, Lord Shiva has destroyed the sacrificial arena and Sati has left her body. This was a terrible, terrible circumstance. Curses shot back and forth. I mean, talk about bad blood. This was one of the worst on a cosmic level, amongst people who are far more qualified than we are. And the first thing Daksha does to Lord Shiva is not even as say sorry, he praises Mahadev. He says, this is who you are. This is who I did not recognize you to be. And so offering genuine appreciation or even more effective if we want to take it a step further, is serving that devotee in whatever small way we can or serving with them in some way, participating, supporting them in their seva. There are few things that purify the heart more effectively than service. And when we offer service to a devotee, 
then, um, then it changes the heart of both the person who has received that service and the person offering that service. Um, the finest example of this in Bhagavatam, I think, is the story of Diti and Indra. You know this story, Diti and Indra? It's a, it's a much less well-known katha, lila, than, than are some of the others in Bhagavatam. Um, you know when uh, Lord Nishingadev killed Hiranyakashipu and Lord Varahadev killed Hiranyaksha. Both Hiranyakashipu and Hiranyaksha were sons of Diti. And Diti is one of the wives of the sage Kashyapa. Another wife is Aditi. And Aditi is the mother of the demigods, specifically Lord Indra. So the demons and the demigods are actually cousins, or not cousins, half-brothers. Um, it's a family feud. And so Hiranyakashipu and Hiranyaksha have been killed, and Diti is really upset. Her sons have been killed. And she blames Indra for this, not even Vishnu. She says, Indra has used Vishnu to kill my sons. And so she says, I want a child now who will kill Indra. So she goes to her husband, Kashyapa, who she knows has the capacity to give him a son like that, pleases him with a lot of service, and when he promises her anything she wants, she says, I want a son who will kill Indra, which is, of course, Kashyapa's other son. And Kashyapa knows that he's in a tight spot. So as a way out, he gives her a formula. He says, if you perform this yagya, this vrata, to Lord Vishnu, you will get what you want. But you have to do it perfectly. No mistakes. And so he gives her a long procedure. You know, eat at this time, don't eat at this time, fast at this time, make sure that you wash your hands and feet before you and your mouth before you go to bed, and then when you wake up, do like this. He gives her a whole formula. You can read it in Bhagavatam. And uh, Diti is determined, and she worships Lord Vishnu perfectly using the formula. In the meantime, Indra is getting extremely nervous because she's going to be successful, it seems, and she's going to be blessed with the son who's going to kill him. So what does he do? Well, he's very cunning. So he shows up at her door and says, Auntie, can I help you with your puja? And you know, it's a family. As in, they fight and they make up. And so Diti says, oh, all right. You can come and you can help me. And so Indra lives with her and helps her in all her puja, prepares everything that she needs for the vrat. And, but he's looking for what? He's waiting for that one moment where she makes a mistake. And he's going to just gotcha. And she's going to lose the fruits of her, of her um, austerity. And sure enough, he finds that. Towards the end of the vratta, one, she's gotten very weak and very emaciated um, as a result of all this fasting. And one day she becomes so weak that she forgets to wash her mouth and her hands and feet before she goes to bed. And Indra knows that he has her. And so while she sleeps, he enters her womb and kills or tries to kill the one child that's present there, the marut, and cuts that marut into, into seven pieces to kill it. But to his shock, they don't die. They all start crying and they say, Indra, why are you trying to kill us? Don't do this to us. And Indra panics and takes each one of those seven and cuts it into seven more pieces. And now there's 49 babies crying. And Prabhupada says this is like a plant. When you cut a branch on certain plants, like a rose, you can put it in the ground and it blossoms into another plant. So each time he cuts, another living entity enters. And 49 voices crying out and saying, Indra, we're your friends. We're not your enemies. Because, of course, she hasn't done the austerity correctly. Right? So she's not going to get Indra's enemy as her child. She's going to get Indra's friend. 
And then they're shocked by this. And he says, I'm so sorry. If you're my friends, then you have nothing to fear. And at that point, at that moment, Diti gives birth to 49 boys, Maruts. And she sees these 49, and she recognizes them not as Indra's enemies, but as his friends. But by this point, all that service for Lord Vishnu has purified her heart. And guess what? Even Indra's heart has been purified by serving her. And so she turns to Indra and she says, um, I have to tell you something. All this austerities, Vratta, you've been helping me with, I was doing this to get a son to kill you. And Indra says, uh, actually, I've got something to tell you too. Um, all this assistance I was giving you was not to actually help you out. I was looking for a way to kill your child. And it didn't work. And they both clarify their intention to each other. And Prabhupada says in the purport to one of these verses, he says, when Diti, Indra's aunt, explained to Indra without reservations what she had wanted to do, Indra explained his intentions to her. Thus, both of them, instead of being enemies, freely spoke the truth. This is the qualification that results from contact with Vishnu. This is the qualification that results from contact with Vishnu. So, first point, first step uh, is expressing genuine appreciation for the person whom we have wronged. And genuine appreciation requires humility and it requires specificity, that we are specific in the appreciation we give. If we can go a step further and we can offer some service to that devotee, then that is going to be even more effective, or if we can assist them in their service to the Lord. Okay. Second step. After we've expressed appreciation, um, then an expression of our mistake, recognizing our wrongdoing. And here again, specificity is crucial that we specifically acknowledge what we have done wrong. Uh, this is the, the, the step of making the actual apology. An apology to be effective um, needs to have three ingredients in it. Okay, so we recognize our mistake is the stuff, make the apology, that's the second step. But how do we do that? Uh, it requires three ingredients. Number one, when we apologize, we specify what is it that we're apologizing for as a specific statement of our wrongdoing. We find this very clearly in the example of Indra and Lord Krishna. After Indra destroys or tries to destroy the, peop the residence and, and, and village of Vrindavan, and he comes down to earth with his head hung low to apologize to Krishna, he tells Krishna, he praises Krishna first, that first step we talked about, but then he apologizes. And the first thing in his apology is he spe specifically states the mistake that he has made. I tried to destroy your beloved Vrindavan. When Daksha approaches Lord Shiva, after all is said and done, Daksha, we don't have time to tell the full story, but Daksha ends up with the head of a goat. And he's apologizing to Mahadev, and he says, uh, he praises him first, and then he specifically states what he did wrong. I failed to give you a share of the sacrifice that you deserved, and on top of that, I insulted you in the assembly. Okay, so a specific statement of wrongdoing, what it is it that we did. The second thing is that the apology has no conditions, ifs, buts, and mitigating factors. 
you know, I, 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 I did insult you, but, but you have to realize that you really had it coming. Um, you know, what you said just before that to me, like, you, that, that was pretty bad too. Or, I, I, I know I, I made a mistake, um, but I was really stressed out that day. I had a really, really long day and I was very tired. And so I'm sorry, but, but I also, it was out of my control. Or I, I made a mistake, um, but, um, uh, you really provoked me. You provoked that mistake. Or I, I made a mistake, but you overreacted too. Like, it was bad, but not as bad as you made it, after all. You stopped talking to me for weeks after that. That was a little too much. We don't want to make apologies that are, um, um, that have all kinds of conditions and caveats to them. We better not, then, make the apology at all. Uh, because it often does more harm than good. Better we wait until we have it in us to actually just make a simple apology. Uh, a simple apology means a specific one, not a general, oh, I'm so sorry. W whatever happened that day, I'm sorry. That doesn't cut it either. This is what I did, I apologize for it. The specificity and lack of conditions together do the magic. I'm so sorry for this and nothing else. No ifs and buts. Uh, you see these ifs and buts a lot when politicians make uh, apologies on Twitter, right? Um, I'm so sorry that you were offended by this. What's it saying? I, I regret the fact that you felt bad. You should be the one apologizing to me for misunderstanding my statement. I regret that you misunderstood. No. And those to sorts of apologies do next to nothing to actually heal a relationship. An apology should have no conditions, but we can do one thing in that apology and that's to clarify our intentions. This is the one thing that you do find in Bhagavatam um, apologies. Not conditions, but clarification of intention. Just like in the, the Diti and Indra uh, story that I told you. When each person apologized, they were both specific Diti saying, I apologize for l trying to do austerities to kill you. And he says, I apologize for assisting you in those austerities to find a way to kill your son. They were both specific. But what made it work was that each put their intention up front. This is what I was intending. And in that case, the intention was negative. But often, our intention can be positive. We make mistakes not intending to hurt another, but um, uh, really trying to achieve something else and then being foolish in our actions and not recognizing what we're doing until it's too late. So clarification of intention helps preserve our sense of dignity, but it also helps that other person understand our humanity. They hear that and they say, okay, this is what you were trying to do. I, I really, that day, when I said this, it came out wrong. I didn't mean to say that. What I actually wanted to say was this. Or, um, I, as I made that apology, uh, as, 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 I, as I did that to you, my uh, intention was actually to help you but I didn't re realize that that's not what you needed. And that was very hurtful, right? So clarification of intention is something that we can add to our apology. Not a condition, not a mitigation, 
not saying, here's what you could have done in the situation to help out. No, merely, this is where I was coming from. Simply because no one but Krishna is present in our hearts. And therefore, the other person may genuinely not know what is there. It should be honest, of course. Making up of fake intention doesn't help. But if we honestly convey our intention, it can be helpful for that other person also to recognize where we were coming from when we spoke in that way. Okay? So, to be effective, an apology should be specific in stating our wrongdoing. What is it that we're apologizing for? It should be without conditions. One can add a clarification of intention. And finally, we should offer some uh, rectification, some suggestion for remedy. What's the next step forward? Please help me make this up to you. Please come to my home for prasad. Uh, please allow me to help you with this thing. Or uh, please tell me what you think I should do to remedy the situation. Some step forward of remedy or rectification. These four things put together, or three things, um, if we count intention as part of the second, um, when put together, make for a very, very wonderful apology. And are likely, not a guarantee, but they're likely to at least soften the person from whom we're apologizing, and perhaps they will offer their forgiveness. Okay? So, first step, offering of appreciation, expressing our humility with specificity. Second step, offering an apology that involves recognizing our mistake and um, stating our wrongdoing, clarifying our intention, and um, suggesting a remedy. The third is feeling genuinely remorseful for what we have done. Now, this may sound like a repeat. Didn't we just talk about apology, making the apology? But it's actually not the same thing. We can recognize a mistake, but not feel remorseful for it. It's actually very easy to do. We do it all the time. We justify that um, to ourselves. I made a mistake, but that mistake is understandable because I was having a bad day, because that person provoked me, because they deserved it anyway, or because they overreacted, this is why I got in that situation. Or I made a mistake, I guess, in the eyes of others, but I was justified in making that mistake because I'm so much senior to them. Or because I'm their father or mother, or because I'm the husband, or because I'm the guru, or because I'm so much more senior in Krishna consciousness, or didn't I make them a devotee? And so we justify, we recognize the mistake, but then in our own minds, not to others, not to that person, but in our own minds, we justify that mistake by a million excuses, explaining to ourselves why what we did was okay given the circumstances. This last item was actually Shringi's main problem in Bhagavatam. Shringi was the boy who cursed Maharaj Parikshit. And Shringi thought, um, you know, when Maharaj Parikshit put the dead snake around the neck of Shringi's father, Shami Krishi, and Shringi found out about this uh, just he heard about this, he didn't even see it. He became so angry at the insult that his father was shown. 
in reality not a huge insult. Um, Maharaj Parikshit was the king. He was um, hungry and thirsty and tired. He wanted a glass of water. The sage was in meditation. He did not respond to him as in the way that he should have to receive an honored guest. And so in frustration, he found a dead snake outside the ashram and put it around his neck. Why? You received me in such a cold way. Here's a cold, dead snake. That's what you deserve. So in a moment of anger, he put it around his neck. Shringi remembered this. He thought of this. And in anger, he cursed Maharaj Parikshit to die in seven days. Um, why? He says, it describes in Bhagavatam why he cursed him. He said, how dare a kshatriya who is so much lower than a Brahmin. I come from a Brahmin family. And these people are like dogs to us who take food of scraps of food from our table if we want to give it to them. And he should dare do this to my father? And so he cursed him. Right? He thought it was justified. Why? Because of his position. Mm -hmm. That my position allows me to make an offense or to make a mistake, and it's justified somehow. So feeling remorse for what we do is not the same thing as recognizing or apologizing for our mistake. Apologizing for the mistake will help smooth the relationship. But what will purify us is the feeling of remorse. And in this story of Shringi and um, Maharaj Parikshit and um, Shamika Rishi, this is the point that Prabhupada emphasizes over and over again in the purports. Every one of the people in that story felt a sense of genuine remorse very soon after it all took place. Bhagavatam describes that when Maharaj Parikshit, he had this whole moment, and uh, actually Prabhupada says in the purport that what Maharaj Parikshit did was not terribly shocking. As in anyone in that circumstance, when you're dying of thirst or hunger, would have acted in some crazy way, a little bit at least. He said, but given who Maharaj Parikshit was, and Prabhupada says he was practically a saint himself, even though he was a king. That act was quite shocking. It was quite surprising. And Bhagavatam says that when Maharaj Parikshit left that, within minutes, he was starting to feel the poking inside his heart, right, of the, the Lord in the heart. He's thinking, uh, was the sage actually ignoring me in the way that I thought he was? Was he pretending to be in samadhi? Or was he actually in samadhi? He was starting to doubt. And Prabhupada writes in the purport that in the heart of any good person, that doubt will emerge very quickly after doing something wrong. That remorse starts to come up. Yeah, was, it really, was, it, was it really as bad as I thought it was? Did that person really deserve what I gave that person? And Maharaj Parikshiv is thinking like that, within hours of leaving that spot. And he's thinking, no, I made a mistake. He was probably genuinely in samadhi. And as a result of this mistake, I'm going to get some reaction. He was expecting it. And let it come, let it come quickly. Why? So that everyone around me doesn't burn in the fire of the, 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 the reaction that I'm going to get, my family. And Prabhupada explains in the purport that when we make a mistake, not just we, but those we are connected to closely also suffer from that mistake. Our family members in particular, he says. We all have to share in the reaction made by the mistake of that one person. And so he's praying to Krishna, let it come quickly and let it come only on me because I don't want everyone around me to suffer for this mistake I've done. 
So he's feeling regret right away, genuine remorse. In the meantime, Shringi has come back home and, you know, he stopped his play. He was out playing with friends and he said this curse in a moment of, in a fit of anger and pride and maybe a little tendency to show off just a bit before his friends. Look at how powerful I am. And he comes home after that to check on his father and starts crying, wailing, and wakes up his father from meditation. And Prabhupada writes in the purport that when a child is burdened with something they know they've done wrong, the natural response is to cry. When they seek shelter and solace for a mistake they've made. And for those of you who have children, you will know this well. Right? They, you tell off a child they've done something wrong or they know they've done something wrong, and crying begins. Right? Because it helps relieve the burden of guilt in the heart. That's how they respond. That's how they deal with it. So Shringi knows something has happened. And of course, Shamikrishi is feeling terrible about the whole thing. He's feeling some sense of responsibility because it was his own son who acted in that way. And so he's feeling terrible, terrible sense of remorse. And so Prabhupada explains that he writes a letter to Maharaj Parikshit to tell him what is to come. You have been cursed to die in seven days. There is no way to retract this curse. And he expresses so much remorse in his letter. Prabhupada says that Maharaj Parikshit does not come to apologize directly to Shamik Rishi for his small transgression because he does not want to embarrass the sage further. The remorse on Shamik Rishi's side and Shringi's side is so great that if Maharaj Parikshit were to show up before him, all he would do is just grind them into the ground even more. To, to keep their dignity intact, he just says, okay, I will accept this and goes to the banks of the Ganga to listen to Bhagavatam. So Prabhupada explains that in each of these instances, all three of them made a mistake and all three of them rectified it very well. Maharaj Parikshit by accepting the consequences and immediately expressing remorse. Shamik Rishi by sending that letter of apology and expressing his remorse. And the child, Prabhupada says, he was a child. And by the regret that he expressed through his tears, he um, expressed his remorse sufficiently. And Prabhupada even ends by saying, Krishna did this whole lila through a child just so no one would be terribly punished for what happened because Krishna wanted this to happen. So the things are resolved nicely. He wanted Maharaj Parikshit to end his life in seven days just so Srimad Bhagavatam could be spoken for the welfare of the world. And so he had to arrange all this, but he didn't want to um, give a huge reaction to whoever it was that would curse Maharaj Parikshit. So he did it through the mouth of a child. Because a child, ultimately, you can't blame a child too much. A little bit, but not a lot. So, the point being, that in, all, in, in, in that wonderful example of mistake and apology, that is the very foundation of Srimad Bhagavatam. Right? Think about this, the entire Bhagavatam begins with forgiveness with seeking and giving forgiveness. That's the very frame story, the foundation of the entire book. In each of that, the key was this feeling of genuine remorse for what had happened. And as I mentioned yesterday, Prabhupada says in the purport, the fire of remorse purifies the devotee of all sinful reaction, as well as the bad mentality that created the, that action in the first place. Okay, so, a specific appreciation accompanied with humility of the person whom we've wronged, um, an expression of apology that is specific and um, uh, uh, unconditional, and 
um, with expressing of our intention, with a suggestion of remedy, and then feeling a genuine sense of remorse connected with it that creates the internal purification that we need. And finally, um, the, the real test is that we act upon that um, suggestion that we made. We make some recompense for what we have done. As they say, words come cheap, right? And so some recompense, some way in which we rectify our behavior and rec offer some recompense to that person whom we've wronged. We this, see this in the story of Daksha and Shiva, where Daksha then goes on with the sacrifice that was interrupted, and this time invites Lord Shiva with a lot of respect, offers him a seat of honor, gives him a share in the sacrifice and words of praise. He does the opposite of what he did before. Durvasa Muni, when he comes down, he offers his obeisances, full dandavats, to uh, um, uh, uh, Maharaj Ambarish, and then sits down, takes prasad, continues where they left off, and, uh, and then asks Maharaj Ambarish, have you had prasad yet? You've been fasting now for a year. Please take prasad. Right, so offering some recompense, some, some way to correct the wrong that we've made. Um, just like Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu tells Jagain Madhai, um, I will forgive you for all the mistakes you've made. I'll take all your reactions. And the Lord embraces Jagain Madhai. And so, so many sins he takes that his body turns blackish for a moment from his usual golden color. But he says, I will forgive you on one condition, which is that you do not commit these same sinful activities again and again. Right? Never again. So making recompense is the real test because uh, so often apologies end with, I'm so sorry and I hope I never see you again. Right? <laughs> because we're still angry inside. Right? We're still ha harboring that feeling. So you, we just blurt it out of our mouths and hope um, we never have to run into that person again. In that case, the, the relationship is still not healed. Okay, so uh, four steps right, that we find in Bhagavata apologies. One last thing I want to address, which is... Um, that element of fear. Making an apology is scary. Asking for forgiveness is scary. We might have to apologize for more than what we did, but most importantly, it's scary because we don't know how that person will react. Um, sometimes you offer an apology, you put your head on the ground and someone just steps on it, or kicks sand in your face or pushes you, breaks your back when you're already down. And this is a fear, it's a genuine fear that we may have. Apologies are scary, they take a lot of courage. And this is why we find one other important role in many of the Bhagavatam's apologies. Not just the forgiver and the one seeking forgiveness, but a third person a mediator. S the mediator's role is to facilitate the apology on both sides by protecting both sides. This is a person who's trusted on both ends and protects the person making the apology by ensuring that they leave with some dignity that they're not crushed by the person whom they're apologizing to. But also protects the person who is forgiving, who is being asked to forgive, by making sure that the apology is genuine, that it's not one of these half-baked, self-justifying apologies that we talked about. 
So the mediator's role is to make sure that the apologizer is being genuine and the person who's receiving the apology does not mistreat that person in their moment of humility and weakness. And so you find this most notably in the um, Govardhan Lila, in Indra Lila, where the mediator is Surabhi, the cow. She is someone who's trusted by Indra because she is the cow from the heavenly planets. This is Indra's cow. And she's trusted by Krishna because Krishna is Go Brahmana Hitayacha. He's the lover of cows and the protector is Govinda, he's Gopala. He trusts cows like anything and they trust him. So she's the perfect mediator in that circumstance. And Indra comes placing her in the front as a cushion because he knows that Krishna will be softened that he's not going to, I mean, Indra doesn't know, right? Clearly, he doesn't know Krishna well at this point in his life. He doesn't know. When he comes to Krishna, is Krishna just going to take out his Sudarshan chakra and slice off his head? He certainly deserves it, right? Indra has done an offense that is unimaginable. There is no one in this world more dear to Krishna than the Vrajavasis. Krishna never leaves Vrindavan because the Brajavasis are so dear to him. And Indra tried to kill them. Not one, but every one of them. So Indra certainly deserves that fate. He knows it, and yet, of course, he doesn't want it. And so he brings Surabhi. He brings her up front with the hope that Krishna will see Surabhi. And if she can advocate on his behalf and say, please, be compassionate, be kind, be gentle, Krishna will. And when Indra makes his apology, the first person who bathes Krishna is Surabhi, uh, showers Krishna with uh, her milk, right? So um, you see this in the role of Surabhi in Indra Leela. In the story of um, Daksha and Shiva, there was also a mediator. I mean, that was really bad blood between very, very great people. And Daksha is, you know, he's already lost his head. And now for his recovery, who's going to help? So in that case, you know who the mediator was? Brahma. Lord Brahma comes. Uh, um, actually, all the demigods, they go to Lord Brahma uh, and uh, those, those associates of Daksha. Uh, and... They go to Brahma and they say, um, this has really turned out to be a big mess. What, do we, what, what, what should we do? And Brahma tells them, he says, Lord Shiva is greater than you can imagine, than I can imagine. The mistake you've made is very serious because he's deeply attached to Sati, his consort, and you've managed to force her to end her life. So my advice, Brahma says, is don't wait. Right? That earlier point we were talking about. Don't, 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 you know, tarry here. Move quickly on this. Because being in Lord Shiva's uh, bad books is not going to do you well over time. And, um, and so he gives them good advice. But the most important thing he does is he accompanies them to Lord Shiva. They go together to Kailash to meet him. Why? Because the demigods know that Lord Brahma is someone that Lord Shiva deeply respects. Even though Brahma recognizes that Mahadev is greater than him, spiritually speaking, but Lord Shiva regards Brahma as his senior because he emerges from him. And so they know. And so as soon as Brahma arrives there, Mahadev stands up and offers him respect. And Lord Brahma intercedes on uh, their behalf and says, please, you're so great. They're like your children. And when a child makes a mistake, the parents don't take it too seriously for too long. Please, 
let go of your anger and find a remedy. Give back Daksha his life. Give back Pusha his teeth. Give back this person his arms, right? They go through a list because this was, yeah, this was bad. People have lost their teeth, they've lost their arms, hands, legs. So many things were lost. Um, and, and Lord Mahadev's, he's Ashutosh, he's easily pleased. He says, it's okay. I, I just wanted to teach everyone a lesson. I don't bear a grudge. Um, and here's the remedy to going forward. But Brahma's inter intercession is very, very important in that circumstance, serving as a mediator. When Dhruva makes his mistake in killing so many yakshas, this is the part of the story we didn't tell yesterday, but afterwards he becomes very angry when his, his uh, brother Uttam is killed by a yaksha. He decides to kill every single yaksha on the face of the earth. And Swayambhuva Manu comes and intercedes his grandfather and says, it's okay, calm down, please, and, and brokers a peace. So the role of the mediator is crucial for protection on both sides. And this role is particularly important for those in the community who are senior, who are senior and widely respected uh, amongst the community, but especially amongst both parties. Now, there's no, there's no mediator if you just bring your best friend to advocate on your behalf. That's pointless. Or if they bring theirs. And it has to be someone who's genuinely respected on both sides, who's seen as an impartial person. And this has been the role of seniors, of elders, throughout human civilization and societies and cultures, to bring people together, to serve that role of being a mediator and of demonstrating wisdom in a situation. In each of these examples, Brahma and Swayambhuva Manu, maybe not Surabhi, but everyone was respected on both sides, right? And that makes the whole thing a little more safe for everyone involved. The element of fear goes away just a little bit. Okay, the very last thing. What if, despite doing all of this, forgiveness is not forthcoming? The person is not ready. Maybe they're not even ready to talk to us or to forgive us. Maybe the reaction is not at all positive. Despite the mediator, it's still angry. And that person says, okay, fine, thank you, I heard you, but don't show me your face again. That's okay. Our duty is to seek forgiveness. Sometimes we have to do it once, sometimes we have to do it twice or three times. Sometimes we know we've done it and it's not going to help any further. We seek forgiveness not because we can control a situation or control the other person's reaction, but because it's the Vaishnava thing to do. This is how Krishna expects us to behave. This is how he behaves. So he expects his devotees to behave like this. And so this is where the guidance of advanced devotees, of our spiritual master, of those who are seniors is so crucial to, to, to know when we have done enough when we have done enough. Because sometimes, sometimes if we're fortunate, the person we're apologizing will, will say, like Ambarish did, will say, this is enough. Oh, please stop, it's okay. I, I, I accept your apology. Uh, even I was to blame in that circumstance. Let's have prasad together, right? If we're lucky, that's the end result. And it's a happy ever, happily ever after story. But sometimes the world doesn't work out that way. In that case, the apology is still our duty. And we look to guidance from others to know when we have done enough. Maybe once, maybe a second time is needed. In some situations, we may be directed to apologize for a third time. And then at some point, um, if we have good guidance, we know that we've done our bit. We've done enough 
on our end. And now it's up to that person and up to Krishna to accept that or not to accept. But all we can do is the best from our side. So when is enough enough? That's what we need guidance for. Because in the situation ourselves, um, it's very difficult to see uh, the quality of what we've done and how much of it we need to do. But others can tell us. And so we, we end with that same point that we started with, which is that it's so important for us to have people in our lives whose guidance that we can trust, whose praise and correction we can accept wholeheartedly because we know that whatever they say is coming from a good place. They're our well-wisher. Okay, so there it is. Four steps, appreciation, recognition of apology, genuine feeling of remorse, taking active steps to recompense. The role of the mediator in diminishing fear, and the guidance of those whom we trust and are our seniors who can provide us some guidance in how best to do it and how much of it we need to do. Thank you all so much for your attention. I appreciate it. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Would you like to take some questions? Uh, is it okay? I, I know we're at time now, but we started a little we, we late as well. Take a few questions. So, okay, let's take 15 minutes maybe for um, some questions or comments or maybe some experiences that you would like to share. Thank you very much, uh, Prabhuji, for your wonderful uh, lecture on uh, forgiveness. Um, actually, I have three questions, but I'll try to mix it up. Uh, um, you mentioned that uh, Krishna is in a very difficult situation when it comes to um, forgiving a devotee who has committed an offense or act of which needed forgiveness. In practical sense, it's very difficult for us to know who's a devotee and who's not. So that's one. How do we know? Not just someone who's wearing a tilak or wearing a kantimala. There could be any person. It's very hard to know who devotee is. So yes. That's one thing. I can ask all three now, or one by one? Uh, let me start with that, because my memory is a little short. Um, the, um, uh, it's, it's an excellent question. Um, who is a devotee? And this question is asked uh, by the residents of Kulinagram to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Every year, the devotees from Bengal would come to visit the Lord. And um, they asked him, who is a Vaishnav? And the Lord answered, Anyone who chants the holy name of Krishna once is a devotee. They asked him the next year, and Mahaprabhu gave a more advanced answer. And one who chants the holy name of Krishna continuously. And then they asked him a third year, and Mahaprabhu said, anyone by whose very presence others take the name of Krishna is a Vaishnava. So the definition of a Vaishnava is very, very broad, and of course there are many levels of it. But in relevance to what we're talking about today, let me tell you something that is both amazing and frightening, which is that when, um, uh, so Dhruva Maharaj's mother, uh, sorry, stepmother, Suruchi, who insulted her, died uh, from a uh, burning in a forest fire. She was out looking for her son who had been killed by a yaksha in the forest and a forest fire killed her. And Prabhupada says that she received that reaction. She died because she offended Dhruva Maharaj, who would one day become a pure devotee. Which, when I read that, that was scary, right? Really scary. Every one of us, we hope, will become a pure devotee very soon by Srila Prabhupada's mercy, sooner or later. Right? And we commit some offense or we mistreat someone um, in our family, amongst our circle of friends or whatever because we think we have some superiority or we're more advanced or whatever. And it turns out that they become extraordinary devotees. 
than we have committed Vaishnava Prad in the future. And so the point is that ultimately what difference does it make? Right? What difference does it make? Whether it's at home or it's at work, everyone appreciates a good apology. And these same steps work for anyone. Hmm. Perhaps we have to adjust them a little bit. We use different language depending on who that person is and you know, the, the circumstances may change. So we be practical in how we do it. But it's the same thing, expressing appreciation, being specific in our apology. Even a politician can benefit from this advice in making apologies to constituents, right? This is not, this is not something that is terribly specific to pure devotees only. Thank you. Uh, second one is, you mentioned that uh, remorsefulness is a, um, a feeling of remorseful is different than accepting that I've committed wrong and it actually helps purify oneself. Uh, accepting an apology or giving an apology um, may build a relationship, but remorsefulness um, actually purifies a person. So I can say for myself, I can be very easy to uh, offer an apology, but the remorsefulness uh, does not come straight, for, straight away. So is it okay to um, not offer an apology until the remorsefulness come or offer the apology and then work towards having that remorsefulness as yes. a meditation. Yes. No, it's, it's good to the, the latter. It's good to, to offer the apology as soon as we've recognized we've made a mistake because that's kind to the other person. That's compassionate. Yeah. Then sometimes it takes years for us to recognize the full impact of what we've done and also to recognize what we've learned from that experience. We look back and we th think, yeah, that's what it was. It takes some distance from sometimes to recognize the full extent or to feel the full remorse. And the third one is um, you, I think you were just, whatever question was coming to my mind, you were just on and on and on. I was like, sure, probably in the next purport you'll find the answer for that. So you mentioned about the, the role of the mediator and the seniors in guiding us to protect, especially from uh, the fear or getting crushed. In the absence of mediator, uh, which is trustworthy on to the both party, is it okay that you, are, you want to apologize, you feel remorse, but you are so hesitant to come across to that, uh, to that person, and rather than, because of that fear, you could rather just assist that person in serving or help them serve indirectly rather than going in front and doing that. Is that acceptable? Uh, it's better than nothing to assist in the background. Um, but, but really, face to face, coming up front, I think is the most important thing. And so if we don't have that mediator, then we seek someone out like that. Um, any community of devotees will have people who are of that nature or caliber. We go to them and say, you know, I, I, I'm in this tight situation. Um, would, you, would you mind helping? Um, here's what happened and my intention is not to justify myself. I'm not here to whine and complain about what happened, but I just need a little help to, to sort things out, to make an apology. Um, will you set up a meeting for us? Will you be present? Um, and and we'll, find, we'll find a devotee who's willing to do that. Um, if we don't have someone genuinely like that, anyone we can even approach, then we have a larger problem, right? That, that we, we, we really lack good quality association. Because association means not just our peers, it means those who are senior to us, especially from whom we can learn and whom we can trust. Thank you, thank you very much. Prabhu. Thank you for those excellent questions. All three were wonderful. Yeah. Yes, Prabhu, Thank you, thank you so much uh, for the wonderful class. It just uh, makes time, time disappear. Um, Let's see. Um, so about the people uh, which... Uh, uh, about the what? The people which uh. we need to have in our life and uh, make sure, you, you mentioned, make sure that we have people whom we can trust and we can um, just hear anything and everything from them and make sure that it comes from a good heart. So my question is how exactly... <laughs> We do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
This is the um, essence of what Sangha is, what association, what real association is. Um, we do so many things uh, for association. Uh, we might talk to someone, we might do some seva with them and so on. But the heart of association is this, right? It's described in Nectar of Instruction, dadati pratigrinati guhyam akhyati pritchati bhumte bhojayate chaiva. So having that kind of relationship, uh, dadati uh, guhyam akhyati pritchati, um, where we can reveal our mind in confidence and hear confidentially from someone else, and really what's being described by Rupa Goswami is a relationship of trust. And so this is something that we, we um, actively cultivate. We seek out in our Krishna consciousness that type of association. Um, we, we find people who are of, um, of uh, suitable association, like-minded association. We develop friendship with them and we uh, develop that trust. And often such relationships work nicely when, that, when one person is a little senior and one person is a junior, then that person has the capacity to act as a mentor for us, right? So these relationships develop naturally, organically, over time. Uh, it's not that uh, one can produce them or one can go to just um, find them and say, you know, you, you're, can you be that person? Um, no, we look in our lives and we see who is serving in this capacity anyway, and how can we deepen that? And, and um, uh, you know, perhaps it's a relationship of peers where you're able to say what you think to that person and they're able to say to you. So maybe it's a relationship of equals, maybe it's mentor and mentee uh, in the relationship. But it's something that we cultivate over time. It's one of our uh, greatest assets, our most valuable wealth is to have such relationships in this world, and we have to treasure them. We have to really um, protect them, um, consider them very precious. Thank you. So what I'm hearing actually is um, the key point is association. Can I ask one more? Okay, yeah. one more. Um, so Durvasa Muni and Maharaj Chambarish, um, so Sudarshan Chakra was chasing Durvasa Muni because he was trying to kill Maharaj Barish. So why Sudarshan Chakra didn't chase Indan, who was trying to kill the whole village of Vrindavan? And uh, the cows? Why wasn't he chasing Indra? Yes, mm. he was trying to kill the whole village and the cows, not just one devotee, all of them. So what is the difference? Yeah, there was no need for Sudarshan Chakra to chase, Krishna was there personally. And in each, when Krishna wants to protect his devotees, then he chooses how best he wants to protect them. Sometimes he sends Sudarshan, and sometimes he will come on the back of Garuda flying through the sky like he did for Gajendra. And sometimes he lifts a mountain to give them shelter from rain. And at other times he will pick up a wheel on a battlefield to protect his devotee from being killed by the arrows of the enemy. And other times he will act in other ways, right? So Krishna really chooses how he wants to offer that protection. Sometimes in very obvious ways, like jumping out of a pillar as a half man, half lion. And sometimes in very indirect ways, in very subtle ways, by protecting the devotee internally, by giving them shelter and refuge when no one's watching, like he did with Maharaj Parikshit within the womb. No one could tell that he was being protected from the Brahmasa there other than Parikshit himself and his mother. So Krishna chooses how he wants to protect. That's his prerogative. Thank you so much. Yes. I'm a baton, yeah. I see so many hands going up, but time's moved on. Um, one more question, and then probably I have to take the question in the order of the hands that so go up. And I saw your hand up go third, Prabhu. So please do forgive me, everyone else. Uh, I know there's a few hands. Can I make a suggestion, though? If you have a question that Prabhu is not able to answer, you can email me the question at vrindavanchandra at krishnatemple.com. I'll pass that on to Radhika Raman Prabhu, and maybe you can pick that up in tomorrow's session. Yeah, sure. We can do. I'll, I'll also spend a few minutes after uh, this. Um, this session here, so I'm I'm happy to, to answer personally. Hi Krishna, thank you, Prabhu. 
uh, you know, about the point of uh, revealing your intention. So uh, if a person reveals his intention and tells the truth, and that that revelation agitates further, uh, and it's not benefiting the process of forgiving. So uh, would you recommend telling the whole truth because it's going to further agitate or just asking forgiveness for the offense? Yeah, if it's not helping, then we just ask forgiveness for the offense. Um, it, uh, the, 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 the idea is that when we're seeking forgiveness, the person we're seeking forgiveness from comes front and center. Right? They're the, 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 the purpose is to, um, is to, uh, to heal them. Right? And so if it's not working, then we try something else. Uh, if expressing our intention is not helping, then we keep the apology even more simple. Right? Whatever is practical in that circumstance. Um, before we end, I just want to say one thing, which is this, this whole seminar is obviously organized to convey the glories of Srimad Bhagavatam, which I think many of us in this audience are already convinced of, but also its practical relevance. And why Srimad Bhagavatam is really the panacea for this world and its ills, right? I mean, for something like forgiveness, we all need it and we all need to give it. But there's so many things that we need and we need to give as well. And Bhagavatam has it all, right? And, and, and hopefully yesterday particularly, but also today helped convey that. So just from my end, um, uh, my, my sincere request to all of you to, to number one, make Srimad Bhagavatam part of your everyday life and that of your children. There is no bigger gift you can give to your children than to help them develop an attachment to Srimad Bhagavatam. It's something that they will keep for their entire lives. Long after we are gone, they're going to keep that. And the best way to do, do that is to study Srimad Bhagavatam as a family, right? to do it together, to make it the heart of our family life. Uh, because if we talk through these things together, they help us on all levels, spiritually, but also family-wise. Our relationships grow deeper and stronger, and the children's relationships at school go better, and their ambitions are more worthwhile and noble in nature. Um, the Bhagavatam has a powerful effect on our consciousness, both for adults and for children. And so let's try to make Srimad Bhagavatam the center of our own lives. And we do that by making sure that we have access to Bhagavatam everywhere. Um, just a few weeks ago, His Grace Vaisheshika Prabhu came to our home in Utah and stayed with us for a few days. And we, of course, have Srimad Bhagavatam um, and two copies of Bhagavatam, one on the, the ground floor and one on the first floor. And um, Vaisheshika Prabhu said, uh, this is not enough. Um, you don't have Bhagavatam at your office. And uh, so he gifted me a copy of Srimad Bhagavatam and then insisted I take two more um, beyond that. Uh, and he was very kind, very generous. And it was incredible because that Bhagavatam was installed at my office. And um, the second copy, right away, um, one of my colleagues at the university, like within days, said, you know, you've been speaking from this book, they come to our small satsang at home, I want a copy of it. And the second one just flew off our hands, just like that. And the third one is going to be installed in our um, sangha room. We've got a room dedicated to our Namahata programs on Fridays and uh, to display all of Prabhupada's books and to give to whoever the next um, willing victim might be of Srimad Bhagavatam. So what I mean to say is from coming from someone who already had Bhagavatam on every floor of the house and coming from someone who's already trying to read Bhagavatam regularly, still it was not enough. Three more sets and they were gone just like that. 
You should have Bhagavatam every floor of your home. You should have it at your workplace. If it's right there, you're going to read it. And if you have an extra copy, it's going to go out to a friend and someone else who's interested. If Bhagavatam's not there, it's never going to go out. Right? So even if you have Bhagavatam, even if you're reading it regularly, please read it even more regularly and take at least three more copies for uh, different parts of your home and office and, and your friends as well. Um, just speaking from my own experience as of one month ago, there's never enough copies of Bhagavatam in your home. Thank you all very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Sadiq Raman Prabhu. As, as forever, you never fail to uh, awaken within our hearts um, aspects of Krishna consciousness and the, and the Bhagavatam. So thank you so much. We've just got a few more minutes to, um, to, to make a few announcements and presentations. As we said yesterday, um, there's two parts to the Bhagavatam. One is to relish, and then the other one is to gift. Now, uh, in the Nectar of Devotion, Srila Rupa Goswami explained 64 items that awaken devotion. And he said, out of the 64, five are particularly potent. And of the five, he mentioned Srimad Bhagavatam. So one who has, has been accustomed to hearing Bhagavatam uh, in the right mood and spirit, love for Krishna will automatically awake, awaken. So how do we know whether that love for Krishna has awakened? What is the symptom of that love? I just want to share one, one video um, where Srila Prabhupada speaks about this. We can go to the PowerPoint, Prabhu. It's embedded in the PowerPoint. Okay, the sound's not coming through. Anyway, we have to have a plan B for everything. So what does Srila Prabhupada say in this video? So Srila Prabhupada first asked the question, what is the symptom of love? What is the main symptom? What is the prime symptom of love? And does anyone know what the Srila Prabhupada explains? What is the main prime symptom of love? Well, I was hoping this video worked, but... Hare Krishna. Yes. So probably he's going to play or not? Yes. Okay. Can you? Okay. By the way, those who are engaged in devotional <coughs> service, what kind of devotional service? Pretty good with love and affection. One who is engaged in devotional service of the law, in love and devotion, what is the symptom of law? Love, the symptom, the prime symptom, most important symptom of love uh, is that the devotee wants to see that his Lord, name, fame, etc., become widespread. Uh, he wants to see that my Lord's name be known everywhere. Uh, this is love. If I love somebody, I want to see that his glory is spread all over the world. And Krishna also says in the Bhagavad Gita, Nasita smart man says you, but sit may be a bit of anyone who preaches. Uh, nobody is there to him than that person. Uh, everything is there in the Bhagavad How you can love? What are the symptoms of love? How he can please God? How he can talk with you? Everything is there. But we have to take advantage. Uh, we read all of us. So there we have it, dear devotees. Srila Prabhupada has explained what is the main and prime symptom of love. So, um, so we... we um, there is no other book that explains the glories of Lord Krishna 
greater than Srimad Bhagavatam. And that's why Srila Prabhupada wanted us to do, to express that love in terms of distributing Srimad Bhagavatam. Yesterday I spoke to you about the Badra campaign that's trying to distribute 43,000 sets of Bhagavatam throughout the world. We're trying to do 600. Again, we are reaching out to all of the devotees. Please become involved in this campaign. You can uh, take one if you don't have. Well, Prabhu said, if you have one, you can take two or maybe three. Or you can gift or you can promote. So again, this is our humble appeal. Um, we showed to you yesterday the Gram Vidya video. I wouldn't show that again today. But there's a big mission we have. Uh, every respectable family should have a Bhagavatam in their home. So um, I think because of time, I'll leave it there. There's just one last video to be shown about the School of Bhakti. The School of Bhakti has been very instrumental in promoting and pulling this event together. And they have a short video uh, just to explain about some of the, the activities. And uh, before we show the video, Prashadam, I need to double check. We were running a little late on the cooking today, but hopefully it should be ready. If not, you can take darshan and we'll serve Prashadam at the back there. So thank you again very much. We do hope uh, to see all of you all again tomorrow. And please, as we said, bring others to this event if you can. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Yes, my friend. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, hundred seventy-five. You wanna do it now? Oh, well, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. How's everything? Are you Prabhu? Yeah, it's okay. Hare Krishna. Just another announcement also. Um, one of the other ways we have for purifying our hearts is to wash pots. So if anyone feels particularly uh, keen to have some extra purification, we have many pots to wash back in our kitchen. You can come and see us and then we can, uh, we can do some seva together. Hare Krishna. And then Radhika Raman Prabhu is kindly offered to make himself available. If anyone has further questions you'd like to explore with Prabhu, you can. Hare Krishna.
Tomorrow's event is 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Just to, as a reminder, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Hare Krishna. You can be happy. Vitaraga Bhaya Krodha. How you can be a man of knowledge? That is our business. Srila Prabhupada said in the villages, they already live simply. They just need to add the high thinking, simple living high thinking, and that's Srimad Bhagavatam. So if we can get some Bhagavatam sets in the villages, people already living simply, they can perfect their lives. So the idea is to get the village leaders to agree to have a Bhagavatam set in a public place where people can, from the village can come and read the Srimad Bhagavatam. Please help us. We are doing this program by the thousands and now tens of thousands. Let's work together. If you donate $200, you will support one village with Vedic knowledge and a teacher who will help to disseminate it to the people in the village.